Um, okay then, so, um, hi, uh, my name is Tejas. I'm going to be speaking about horrible mistakes in isomorphic uh, rendering. I know there's already been like um, about a dozen talks today that speak about isomorphic rendering or universal rendering in some form or the other, but I hope that um, at least my, I, like I'm not going to hopefully cover what everyone else has already uh, covered. So uh, before I start, a little bit about myself. Uh, that's my Twitter, that's my GitHub. Uh, my team doesn't let me actually write any code anymore because every time I do, like everything goes flat. So um, yeah, there's that. And I currently work at uh, Quintype and we're a pub tech platform. We have like a dozen publishers and we need to isomorphically render UIs for them. We're in the media space, so um, server-side rendering is very, very important to us. Oh, and um, it's our two-year anniversary uh, today, so hooray for us. Well, actually, technically, it's yesterday. Um, this brings me to another point that I'll tend to be very factually inaccurate at um, a number of points, but, uh, well, please adjust. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, why are we all here, right? So fundamentally, the web moves pretty fast, right? Oops, and so do my slides. So once upon a time, everything was server, uh, server only, right? And uh, it's even hard to imagine this day when, you know, everything was just rendered server side, and every time you would click an email in Hotmail, it would take you to a completely new page, right? Uh, around 2000, we got the XML HTTP request, maybe 2003. And, um, and so this really was a game changer, obviously, right? And uh, this was made famous by uh, uh, Gmail, which you know, would render your email really fast. And um, the next major advancement towards what I would call isomorphic rendering came with Google Web Toolkit. Now, this is not a thing a lot of people speak about um, these days because it's, it's not as commonly used. But in essence, what this would let you do is you, it would let you write both your backend and your front-end code in uh, Java. Right? And it would somehow do some magic, and the Java that you wrote on the back end would be magically uh, compiled into HTML views on, on the front end. And so for me, this was the first people really trying to do this isomorphic um, rendering. And then finally came isomorphic rendering. As we know it, made incredibly popular by React, even though a lot of people have been doing it in various forms uh, the years before that. And those are some of the things that I'll um, talk about uh, and, of course, I mean universal rendering. This seems to be the term that's come up at, well, the first time I heard it is actually at this conference. I'm guessing the difference is that universal rendering also covers uh, native applications. And I'm going to speak about, um, yeah, and beyond isomorphic rendering are your progressive web apps and, you know, the bright future that we're all uh, moving towards. All right, so, so what is isomorphic really is? Basically, similar in form and relation, that's the Wikipedia definition. I, I, I really don't know how that relates. But what it means is that you're rendering the same thing server side and client side, right? And that's what I want to speak about, different patterns for uh, this, right? So why did we specifically need this is, is sorry, and I'm showing uh, like something from uh, uh, Quintype again, is we, um, we render publishers front end. This is a news site. And you know it needs it needs to be completely rendered server side. But in our CMS, we want to let you see what your story is going to look like as you as you um, type stuff. So we kind of have like you know uh, as you type it um, it updates an iframe and uh, you know things things move right. And of course, this has to happen without duplication, right? You don't want to rewrite everything and have it exactly the same across your back end and front end and pos uh, possibly different languages. In fact, I'd love to meet the programmers who enjoy this amount of um, uh, duplication, right? And it's not just for weird previews like uh, and one-off use cases. Like here's, here's like at least a bunch of reasons for this, um, why you'd want this, including things like a load more infinite scroll, reloading the page, or even on horribly slow networks where sometimes your JavaScript doesn't load and you don't want to give those people an awful experience. Right? So a lot of talks uh, in this conference have been about, uh, yes, we tried this and you know, every, everything worked. Uh, my talk's pretty much going to be the ex exact opposite. It's going to be how I tried all these things and we failed miserably and uh, you know, why you should uh, try this and fail in the same way or not. Uh, yeah, so actually, I, 
this looked like I was supposed to talk about 55 patterns. I'm not. I'm going to cover just about seven, right? So before I actually get into too much server-side rendering, I know this has kind of been touched, especially by uh, Ankur yesterday, but do you even need server-side rendering? It's actually very interesting because we've arrived at a place where 10 years ago, client-side rendering wasn't even really possible. Uh, well, 15, yeah, client-side rendering wasn't even possible. But today, you, you can client-side rendering is almost a given. And the real question is, do you even need to do um, uh, server side, right? And this has actually become a very acceptable pattern, right? Uh, people have spoken about this quite a bit. I'm not going to cover uh, this in in too much detail, but in essence, this is what you would do if you're rendering something client side. You, you'd have you'd have your layout, you'd have a container, you just have nothing in the container, and then server side, you render, um, you know, you you boot React or Angular or whatever framework you would like, right? And this has you know, some benefits. It's, it's great for internal apps and things when you need to log in. And it really solves our problem. There's no duplication. It's, everything is completely, uh, you know, there's, there's just a single source of truth. And with the usual problems, it's slower, and it doesn't support people who don't work for JavaScript. And you know, you're, in essence, you're relying on meta tags for SEO. So how can we improve this? Or what can we do for two of these problems? We've already spoken about um, how you can load a layout only, right? Facebook actually used to do this quite a bit. You'll see that not only is the layout loaded, there's one empty story that's um, rendered over here. And uh, uh, quite frankly, we also used to do this for quite a while. What we would do is once a week, we would just do a React DOM server dot render to string, and we'd save this in a text file somewhere, right? And then the next time, I'll just uh, use that um, straight uh, plain uh, text file, right? And again, it's an empty layout. It's just showing you boxes with nothing in it. So that doesn't need to change uh, very often. So, but this kind of relies on you defining an empty object. So for us, that was a story with no headline. That's, that's my empty object, which I can render without any problem. And uh, now that you're layout only, you know, the next step is a progressive web app. This is, this is like kind of the step just before that, because you, you can easily cache this, and now you can move towards a progressive web app. Right? And the other problem that we actually had was, you know, how we only have meta tags for SEO, right? So we actually thought, okay, let's cheat a bit. Let's, uh, let's just stick on, uh, let's just stick on, uh, like, you know, uh, a div saying content for bots. And this will get wiped out once the component actually loads. And what, what we tried to do over there was we even put it like you know opacity at like four percent so that uh, so that no one can see this ugly unstyled content. But of course that never works. And in reality, someone complained because they could see our ugly unstyled um, content. And I don't know if you can actually see it; it's too uh, faded. Uh, <clears throat> so what does isomorphic uh, rendering actually look like? So let's talk about uh, Node.js. That's what everyone seems to be uh, using these days. Yeah, it's, it's really easy to uh, isomorphically render stuff in uh, Node.js. In a sense, and I know, again, Ankur has kind of mentioned some of these things, but you just do a render to a string uh, with the same component that you, would, that you will mount later. And of course, virtual DOM, it's the greatest thing since Nutella. And it will it'll basically take over. You don't have to pay that penalty for reloading your entire um, your entire DOM. Um, yeah. So um, the the only um, the only two problems that I've kind of have uh, come into this is, is it's hard to do this after the fact when you already have a JavaScript. There's enough. Um, you will have done enough hacks and stuff, which would be very browser specific, such that it's hard sometimes hard to port this to Node. And I'm also calling out, you can actually crash your entire server if, 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 you, if you have badly maintained, uh, badly written uh, uh, front-end code in this model because it's the same code running. So I think, I think one of the mistakes that we continuously do is you need to remember the importance between a component will mount and a component did mount. And remember that the first one runs on the server. So if you're trying to access something, you can actually take down your entire, um, you know, your node app. Uh, yeah, you can, it'll get relaunched and stuff, but you'll start noticing that your requests per second are dropping pretty drastically. So for this also, we had a small solution. You can play with, um, with the node ships with a, with a module called VM, which allows you to actually load untrusted code inside a sandbox. And you can, 
uh, yeah, and, and, and you can run your code uh, that way. Okay, so won't every, anyone think of the Ruby developers? This is my uh, this is this is really the um, where I'm actually starting the real important thing of my talk. So how many people are using Node.js in uh, uh, for their backend? Like show of hands. Yeah, it's about uh, twenty percent of my audience, right? So. So, so what about everyone else? What, what is everyone doing? And I, I was just joking that the Node people are just stealing jobs from hardworking Ruby developers, right? So <laughs> let's get to all the anti-patterns that you can um, do in this world, um, you know, when you're running a different language um, at, the back, at the back end. And hopefully we'll get to some patterns as well. So the first is HTML APIs, right? And this is the first one I see every single programmer coming and doing on every single project. They will always do something to this effect. And I'm going to switch to uh, Ruby for a bit of time, right? So in essence, this is what it looks like. So I'm going to render, when I come to the story page, I'm going to render the story page with a layout. And then when somebody calls the API for the same page, I'm going to render the exact same story with no layout, and I'm going to return this as a JSON object, right? This looks, actually, it looks like it works because it works really well on your development laptop, right? And it's great because there's no duplication, but it's widely considered an anti-pattern, so why? Well, all of a sudden, you, uh, well, so first of all, you get to have fun playing this new game that you've magically invented called, how did this HTML get over here, right? And you're continuously looking at the various calls because you're, in essence, rendering bits of HTML from a server and embedding it somewhere else without like context. And you'll continuously be wondering, how did your HTML get over there? And as a second um, added benefit, your super fast uh, API call is now ridiculously slow, right? The slowest thing about Ruby on Rails typically tends to be server-side rendering. Uh, I mean, your, your rendering of your views, right? So you're, in essence, making your APIs also start to render views, and this is horribly slow. So you will increase your... Amazon bill by double, and you won't know why. Yeah? PJAX and Turbolinks is, in essence, the same thing. Uh, how many people are familiar with PJAX or Turbolinks? Yeah, very few. Anyway, so in essence, what you'll do is you'll make, a, you'll make an AJAX request and get an entire new page, and you'll strip out everything outside the body or the container, and you'll just dump it right onto the page. Uh, the argument here is that if reloading the whole page without reloading the JavaScript and CSS is a lot faster than actually doing a new uh, page load. It is, uh, it is very true, but it's fundamentally the same thing. And for that reason, you will still um, see the loss of performance based on your, um, uh, based on your network calls and your uh, rendering. So that brings me to pattern number four, which is mustache, handlebars, and uh, liquid. This actually is uh, pretty viable. And so when I was talking about different patterns of isomorphic rendering in the non-React world, or the non-Angular world, this is actually what people, uh, people do. This, th these became incredibly popular after, I think, uh, Ryan Bates uh, from Railscast did a, did a quick Railscast on how to just do like, a, a, like an infinite scroll with, um, um, uh, with, uh, with a mustache and, and an API, right? So in essence, your mustache code looks like this. It's, it's logicless, right? And I'm going to speak a little bit about this logicless and why it's like very important to us. But in essence, you know, th this is what it looks like. It, it, it looks pretty, um, if you're familiar with other templates, it's, it's good. One difference that uh, I wanted to call out is this is actually rendering a string. So unlike JSX or unlike, um, uh, you know, uh, um, other um, like React based things, this is actually not rendering a virtual tree. So if you want to, um, do any virtual DOMs type stuff, you will need to do that yourself, right? So the benefits of this is like it works across every single language, right? Uh, you, and you can even try out for little bits of it. You just have one component that you want to turn into mustache. You don't need to rewrite your entire architecture. You can just move that one component into, into mustache and render it um, isomorphically, yeah? And, and I'm going to say it's, it's incredibly secure. So what do I, what do I mean by secure? Um, on my first slide, I was mentioning that we're actually running tens and twenty, you know, templates, some of which are not even written by us, right? So what stops any of these templates from suddenly throwing an exception and taking down chunks of my server, or overriding some global um, object? Mustache, uh, handlebars, liquid, uh, twig—these uh, th things don't let you um, 
uh, you know, run uh, arbitrary functions, arbitrary code. They're very well defined and they have a certain way of accessing data. And of course, that comes with a price. They're amazingly hard to write. Yeah? It takes a long time. You, you'll, you'll, I, more than once I've been tearing out my hair going like, oh my god, why is this, uh, how do I write this loop in this, in this certain way? Yeah? But um, there's also a bunch of practical problems that come with them, uh, not least of which is that liquid, uh, sorry, handlebars, for example, is very tied to uh, JavaScript. So even the Ruby on Rails um, uh, version actually um, moves and kind of uses uh, JavaScript uh, to run it. <sighs> so this brings me to the fifth um, pattern that you could use, which is to, in essence, bring your own language to the, to the front end. And this was made incredibly popular by uh, ClojureScript, right? And this was important to us because we at Quintype were also a, a Clojure shop. Um, in essence, what, what this does is it's, um, it's uh, this is also built on React. I think this is using RUM, which is one of the ClojureScript built on top of um, React um, components. But what this has, in essence, done is it's introduced a second um, level of... Um, of, um, in essence, JSX. It's, it's uh, represented a second uh, level of, um, you know, to represent this uh, DOM tree, right? And, and this uses a syntax which is known as hiccup. I've just put, put that over there. This pretty much works exactly as you would expect it to. It, it, it does work. But again, there are a bunch of advantages and disadvantages. This is not a gold mine. Um, you can even generate CSS, by the way, from Clojure, and it, but it's impossible to, uh, a, find people who do this, side note that we're hiring, and you'll end up passing closure objects around, right? So again, this is another one of those things that when you get started, it looks like it's really great. It's like, you know, I have an ordered set on my closure um, uh, Java backend, and when I pass this to closure script, you know, I magically have the same uh, ordered set. But as it, this gets deeper and deeper, you'll realize that, the, that there are very fundamental problems with this, right? Another one of the reasons that uh, GWT kind of fell out of favor was that it very much blurs the interaction between the front end and the back end. And when you kind of hide that what's a network call and what's a local call, you'll start writing very, very unperformant uh, code. Again, these are very problems that you can solve by training, but it's still, um, you know, there's still problems. And the tools and debugging is also pretty slow, uh, I mean, pretty hard to use at times, because wh what you have in your browser is a closure object, which is represented by a, 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 an array of JavaScript objects. And unless you know the closure thing very well, you're not going to use it. And as an added bonus, you get to add uh, line again to the list of um, great package managers that, uh, you know, that you use for JavaScript. Um, Okay, and so um, what we finally uh, ended up doing mostly is to use, a, in essence, a rendering server, right? And so, yes, in part, this is, again, just relying on Node.js, but I'm going to speak about two or three different uh, um, attempts we, we did at this, right? So the first is actually kind of well, well explored, which is Phantom uh, phantom.js. Uh, a lot of people use phantom.js for testing, but it's also widely used in the Ruby community for... Um, for rendering uh, HTML as well. Um, what it actually does is, is that it, um, it just takes a HTML uh, body and it actually evaluates whatever JavaScript you've written. It actually has its own DOM in memory. It has, um, it, it, it does everything. And because it does all of this, it's actually a little bit resource intensive, right? But you can cache this. For content that's not moving very fast, it is very easy to render with PhantomJS and uh, and cache this content so that you um, you know you don't have to worry about it again. Um, but we thought, can we do a little bit better? Can we just take the exact same architecture and use some of React's inherent um, you know benefits, right? So we tried building our own rendering server, which is yeah. Um, internally, we still use this for uh, quite a few things. But in essence, what it's really not that many lines of code. We ha I've removed some of the VM stuff. But in essence, what I'm just doing is I'm listening on some port. It's a Node.js app. And really what I'm doing is every request, I just look at what page do you want me to render. If so, I just render the string with whatever um, arguments you want. So fundamentally, what I do over here is I, is I 
send my rendering server JSON, I get back HTML, and I munge this with the HTML from my layout, and I, and I return it back. And I was pretty impressed with, um, with um, this, will, this is actually pretty fast on very cheap uh, Amazon hardware. Um, yeah, if you're on the same machine, you can like, kind of sort of get almost like five or six milliseconds for this, uh, or less. Um, yeah, okay, so the, the only problem is it's, um, it's um, a, a bit tough to maintain. You need to um, put this into your asset pipeline, and if you come to our booth, maybe I can talk a little bit more about that, but in essence, what we have to do is, after you pre-compile stuff, you need to bundle this server to use the latest version of your assets and make sure there's no discrepancy between the assets that you serve and the assets that are statically rendering stuff. Otherwise, it'll get very confusing. And if you have uh, tens or 20 uh, themes, this also starts becoming incredibly um, hard to maintain. Right? And one more, uh, one more, actually this is an open source app called uh, Shunter. This fundamentally takes um, all the same ideas, except it switches around the direction of, of what's going on. Yeah? By default, your rendering server, that is Shunter, acts as a proxy. Yeah? And just forwards all requests back to your um, API server, web server, whatever it is that's, that's behind it. And in case you respond with a magic header, in this case a magic uh, content type, then it'll render its, its layout right there. So in many ways this again just becomes, uh, it's a very good separation of concerns because you can, you can uh, split your API out and, uh, and uh, just um, you know, have, have a server dedicated for the view thing. So it also forces you to separate your code base in, in a very uh, clean way. Oops. And of course, um, the logical extension of this is to just, um, coming back all the way to the circle, is to have a service-oriented architecture where your APIs are served by whatever, your front end is um, either with JavaScript or whatever. But just keep in mind, this also is not some kind of, uh, uh, doesn't solve all your problems because you might, the, pro the problems with large service applications kind of come up, in which case now you have 10 services and each one needs to manage their own caches and figure out when to invalidate. And yeah, so, so that, that's sort of my uh, summary. Choose what you'd like carefully. I didn't um, come uh, here to tell you that this one way of doing it is better than um, the others. Um, and yeah, it looks like I'm making up for lost time. So uh, does anyone have any questions? Okay, I guess that's uh, no questions then, or? No questions? I guess not. Okay, thank you.